All right, thank you. All right, so we, we just heard some amazing stuff, futuristic things, which are not that far into the future from Zach and Sean. Um, what I'm gonna be showing is not yet leveraging things like large language models and some of the advanced um, NLP and other digital twin stuff, but this is things that are kind of based on stuff that's been validated. It's very practical and can be implemented into I2B2. So this is a computational pipeline for how you could um, integrate phenotypes into I2B2 today. Um, most of the algorithms that I'm gonna be talking about were developed by Tang Shi Kai and her team. She's a, a biostatistician who's been working with us on I2B2 since the very beginning. So you can ask me questions after this about engineering her stuff into I2B2, but uh, if you're asking me some of the details of her methodology, that's why us informatics people partner with statisticians. So this is getting back to what Sean was saying. Diagnosis codes often have low precision for predicting the patient's true condition or phenotype. As he mentioned, about half the patients with a ICD-10 code for type 2 diabetes will actually have type 2 diabetes. It could be just a billing code, or it could be someone has type 1 diabetes and was accidentally entered in as type 2 diabetes. So what we're trying to do is find these patients down here who really do have that phenotype. Um, there's real implications of this. A clinical trial might be launched at a site thinking they have all these patients they can recruit. And when you find out halfway through the study that you can't recruit enough patients, uh, uh, it's a big reason why um, trials might fail. So what we're trying to do here is create computational phenotypes or algorithms that can target in on these patients who truly have the disease. I put algorithms in quote because algorithms mean different things to different people. You'll see there are some phenotyping algorith algorithms which just follow a set of rules, and then there are others that are leveraging much more complex machine learning methods. So this is a really basic approach to selecting phenotypes. It's been an I2B2 from the start, just selecting multiple occurrences of a condition. So if you drag in type 2 diabetes and hit run, it's going to give you twice as many patients as it really matches. But you can click the occurs button at the top and say, I'm looking for patients who have more than two occurrences of diabetes in their record. And what that will do is it will increase the precision. The patients who re get returned from that query are probably more likely to have diabetes, but you're reducing the recall. You're going to lose a uh, number of patients by uh, who really do have diabetes by doing this crude method of doing the phenotyping. So this can introduce biases by selecting sicker patients or patients who might have just more years of data. So can we find a better approach than just looking for multiple occurrences? So if you're a physician, you may be able to build more complex rule-based phenotypes. So leveraging clinical knowledge to define inclusion exclusion criteria so here, if you want to increase the precision, I can say I'm looking for patients who have type 2 diabetes and have been prescribed insulin and have an elevated hemoglobin A1C. If I want to um, increase the recall, I can do ORs instead of ANDs. Um, the problem with these rule-based algorithms is they could be expensive to develop and validate with chart review because you need the clinical, clinical experts to help do this work. You can't do this at a very large scale because you'd have to bring in all those different people. It overlooks the complexities and data quality problems and biases within each individual institution's EHR. This rule-based algorithm might work well at my site, but it might not work well at a different institution that doesn't have the exact same data elements that I do. There are some really complicated rule-based phenotypes that are out there. There's a website, VKB. You can download these flowcharts for about 85 different phenotypes. You go through all these different steps on the types of diabetes they have, the medications they have, and it'll give you a yes, no, or answer. But again, these are really difficult to develop and also in to integrate into I2B2. You have to program up each one of these things in order to be able to get it to work within your um, database. Emerge is a, one of the um, large contributors to this. So then we get to machine learning-based phenotypes. So the AI ML models, they estimate a probability that a patient has the particular phenotype that you're interested in. They can do this by integrating many different features from the chart, diagnoses, medications, laboratory tests, just like the rule-based one, but it, could, it will be able to do this in an automated way. Um, it places higher weight on the things that are better evidence for the phenotype you're looking for. Um, and this can be generated at scale because it can all be done automatically. Um, 
it's not saying these are the patients with diabetes, it's assigning a probability. So you set your threshold to where you wanna balance the precision in the recall. So in order to get to the description of how we implement this in ITB2, I'm gonna give um, a little bit of background on innovations that led up to this. So I'm gonna start back in 2010, Sean mentioned fee codes. Fee codes are work that were developed for FIWAS studies where they mainly went through um, at that point, ICD-9 codes and group them into um, clusters of codes that represent a disease. And this has been extended for, two, for, uh, for ICD-10. So it says, these are all the different codes that might appear in the chart that should all be rolled up to type two diabetes. So that's kind of a starting point for algorithms that we use moving forward. We're not looking at the raw data that's in your EHR, we're rolling them up to a higher level grouping. And then phenorm, which again, Sean brought up is, um, say, okay, correct, the more diagnoses a patient has, the more likely they have that condition, but it's relative to the healthcare utilization. Uh, the example of if you have, again, if you have three visits of diabetes out of five visits, that's probably diabetes. But if it's three diabetes visits out of 100 visits, it's less likely that the patient really does have that condition. So when you're looking at the distribution of the number of times a patient had the condition, you can imagine there's two underlying populations. There's the population in red that really does have that condition. And then there's the population in blue, which are the patients who are somehow randomly assigned that condition all because of a typo when the billing code was entered in or because it was assigned for some other reason. But by normalizing this based on the healthcare utilization, it comes out with these two kind of clean Gaussian curves. They did this for many different conditions and you get that same picture and it's easier to um, separate out those two different populations. So then there were two additional algorithms that Sang Shi Kai's lab developed. One's called Kesser and the other is Comap. So what Kesser does is we were looking at the number of times the diagnosis was given and the healthcare utilization, but what about all the other stuff that's in the patient's chart? In our I2B2 ontology, we have millions of concepts. And that's a huge feature space to look at. So what Kesser does, is it uses um, embedding regression to narrow that down to maybe about 200 features. And it says, these are the 200 features that you should include in your phenotyping model. It doesn't assign a coefficient to it. It doesn't build a model. It's just by looking at co-occurrences of things that happen in patients' charts across the entire EHR, it says these are things that look interesting relative to this disease. And this is pretty fast. In just a few hours, I ran this at Beth Israel. It gave me the suggested variables for um, 985 phenotypes that I have at my, the hospital I work at. Um, again, things roll up. So it uses fee codes for diagnoses. Uh, for medications, it will roll up to the ingredient level. It doesn't really care what brand it is, it's what ingredient was needed to treat the condition. Um, for LOINC, it rolls up to biomarkers and procedures. It uses a, a CCS um, grouping. And then COMAP is the algorithm that then assigns coefficients to those features to turn into an actual model. Um, and then it also will tell you where to do that probability cutoff to um, uh, what's the optimal point in order to uh, build the best model. And all this is to reduce the need for chart review. You don't need to get a whole bunch of clinical experts to tell you what features there are, and you don't need all the clinical experts to build an extensive gold standard to figure out where to do the cutoffs. And then most recently is again, removing the patients with low utilization. So phenotypes need a certain amount of data to be able to have confidence in the result. So a patient just came once to your institution for a injury at an emergency department, and that's the only information you have about them is literally you can say about whether or not they have diabetes. So you have to filter those patients out. There are simple approaches to doing this in the pipeline that I'm talking about here. We're just looking for patients who had at least three visits since 2010. I'm picking 2010 at my institution because before 2010, the medications weren't as complete. They didn't launch the recon medication reconciliation efforts until later. So you get 15 years of data of patients coming with diabetes who have no medications. So the model thinks that diabetic patients don't take any medications and it'll train on that. So you need to start with a cohort of patients that have sufficient data and who look like what the new patients are coming in will have. There are a lot more advanced approaches. So this paper that just came out is using a machine learning model to predict the completeness of the patient's record. 
just the loyalty cohort algorithms, and you could use that as an alternative. These have different kinds of biases, and you can pick one that's um, uh, appropriate for what your application is. So results, so I'm gonna show you what those different algorithms I talked about look like at my institution. So I said I ran the Kesser algorithm on almost a thousand different um, diseases and for each one, it gave me a range of about 100 to 300 different features. It doesn't say anything about the weights or what should be included in a model, but these are things that you should consider. So for type two diabetes, it has diabetic retinopathy, type one diabetes, maybe not supporting, but maybe an against um, uh, evidence um, for it. You can go through the list. And again, these took a few seconds per phenotype. I didn't have to find a clinical expert to come and get this from me. And then um, I plug this into Comap and it throws out a lot of those and says, these are the ones that stay in there. And I truncated this a little bit, but there's a weight for type 2 diabetes. It discounts the utilization. It tells me these are the positive things that are evidence for a patient having diabetes if they have metformin or hypertension. And these are other things that would be evidence against it. And then I take that model and I calculate a score for all the different patients at Beth Israel who have a code for diabetes. And I plot on the x-axis, this is the score, and then this is the distribution. I see the two bumps like the phenorm paper predicted I would, would see, and then the code then fits two Gaussian curves to it. And it says this orange curve represents the distribution of scores for the patients who have diabetes. And the dashed blue curve are the ones, the patients who don't have type two diabetes, but had the code for it assigned to them for some reason. And then you just look at the ratio between those two curves and it tells you the probability that the patient is in the orange curve versus the blue curve, given the, co the score that they have. And where these two curves cross, that's the 50th percent, uh, the 50, uh, the 0.5 probability that they have that condition. And that could be a basic cutoff that you use. And the code I actually bump that up a little bit higher. So I'm trying to get higher precision to be more confident that the patients um, really have that condition. So here's another way of visualizing this. This is the graph that Sean is talking about, but with actual dots representing patients here. So the x-axis is the log of the number of um, dates that the patient had the fee code in the chart. So the number of times they have diabetes um, mentioned. And the vertical axis is the number of visits, so the utilization. So the, the green vertical line here is that basic approach that we've had for 15 years. We're just looking at number of occurrences. So I would say um, everyone who had more than two occurrences of diabetes um, has the condition and the ones that less don't. Um, but here we're going to also filter out the ones of low utilization. So I'm going to remove these. The fee norm algorithm from a few years ago just draws this purple line and says everything above that line um, is not diabetes, the ones below are. And then by integrating these other variables, the newer COMAP algorithm can say, oh, these over here probably actually do have diabetes because they have some additional evidence. And some few over here may not because they look maybe more like type 1 diabetes. Um, then this feeds into your database and you have all these um, patients with a phenotypes associated with them. But even though all this is unsupervised, um, in the end, you need to do some validation on it. So you could need to do some spot checking of the final list of patients who um, are flagged as having the phenotype by looking and doing some chart review. You don't have to do hundreds of charts. You do maybe 15 charts, you confirm that the pa patient really does have that phenotype and you put those in there. So um, I think they started up maybe around 100 or so at MGB, and then some of the models don't get the performance that's predicted by the um, algorithms, but the ones that do work, you can put those into the system. Again, this whole thing was just a few hours to develop over with the pipeline. So quick on the implementation of this. Most of this are store procedures that you add to your I2B2 instance that calculates all the input that's needed for the R algorithms. There's three R scripts that calculate the embeddings, do embedding regression, and then compute the phenotype models. The raw data comes from your observation fact table. The phenotypes are stored in a table called the derived fact table. Um, the, the, these algorithms are a little bit different than other things you've worked with with ETL. There's some tuning involved in here, and you might have to get into some of the weeds of the R code. 
Um, not all of it I understand. I got to work with Sanchi, who's the statistician, to help me understand some of the tuning pieces of this. Uh, my, you know, there's a good chance to work out of the box, but just kind of to, to warn you on that. Um, what's important here, just before I finish up, the patient level data in this pipeline never leave the database. The stored procedures generate only aggregate counts and statistics. That information is pulled out and given to the R scripts. So the R scripts can be separate from where you have your I2B2 implementation. Um, you could, or the, or the summary files from different institutions can actually be merged together. So what you could really do, and we're going to hear more about the ENAC network, you can imagine something like each of the different sites in a big shrine network are generating these aggregate files. You can merge them centrally without any patient level data and come up with phenotype algorithms that will be robust across the entire network. And then finally, the, we have the code available in GitHub. Right now it's under my repository and it's fairly early on. We haven't done a lot of extensive testing. This is in SQL Server, will be converted to Oracle and then ultimately incorporated into the actual I2B2 platform. But you can take a look, there's extensive documentation on this and see, um, uh, try it out at your institution and see, or just take a look at the different steps on how this will um, eventually plug into your system. Thanks. And I think there'll be questions for both either me or John. Thank you for your wonderful talk. So can we use digital twin and the computational phenotype system to explore disease comorbidity and predict the future disease risk of a patient for predictive health purpose? This is the computational phenotypes I'm showing here are where you go from the raw messy data in the patient's chart to what's the truth about the conditions the patient has. So this is going to tell you the patient has diabetes and asthma and hypertension and doesn't have these other diseases. Um, but then I think it's the digital twin part that will allow you to do the, those predictions. Yeah, so uh, good, good question, although um, predictions aren't explicitly built into the model. In many ways, you know, the digital twin is intended to uh, give you a rendition of what the patient is experiencing or has, has right now, right? Now, obviously, you can use that data and, and try to forecast what's gonna happen with the patient. And um, you could put lots of digital twins together and you know, look at them at different time points and make predictions that way, but, or, or, or make inferencing and, and predictions that way. But explicitly, the digital twin does not you know, out of the box, give you predictions of what's going to happen with the patient. Thank you. Yes. Yes, Louisa. Great work, you guys. The question is for you, Dr. Phil. It's a little bit tall for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great work, guys. And I have a question. So when you guys talk about digital twins, the number one thing is the high quality. So like when when you guys doing the um, use the computer phenotype definition to create a pipeline, like do you do any validation on the phenotypes you guys use? Thank you. Right. Uh, right. So the, the algorithms are unsupervised. So they're just looking at the data and trying to figure it out from what it sees there. But before you actually in, implement this into your production network, you need to do some spot checks to make sure it worked. And as we find there, not all of them work. And it's hard to know which ones are the ones that are working versus the ones that don't. So you're going to need a clinician to do some manual chart review to make sure that that phenotype is pulling out what you want. But it's different from needing a clinician to come up with initial gold standard to develop the model. For that, you might need hundreds of charts that have to be reviewed. But to do the validation, you need handfuls of patients. But do you feel like sometimes the reason that it didn't work is probably because the data like from different sites are different and they have different characteristics and that's why it didn't work? And is there any threshold that you have saying that when you do the chart review, like is there any sensitivity or specificity that you require that to pass for it, like for it to call it it works or successful? Yeah, I think, I think at MGB, they, they wanted a, a precision of 90% as, as the threshold on that. And again, these, 
these vary based on your use case. You may be looking more for a recall um, and is, is instead, of, instead of precision. Um, another thing that was embedded in your question is the transportability of models. So a model developed at one site, when you put it at another site, may not work because it's trained at one. So that was an advantage of the method that we're actually using because the data that's being plugged into the algorithm that's generating the phenotype is only needing aggregate counts. So you could take the aggregate counts from many different institutions, sum them up, and then build a model off of that combined data set. And then that model will be robust across the different sites because it wasn't trained for one site specifically, and then without any information about the other locations, we're gonna use it. So typically at NGB, what we do is we use like 20 to, to 100, sometimes if, you know, 200, but usually in that range of uh, chart reviews per phenotype to kind of validate that the phenotype is working, so to speak, right? And there are reasons that it might, even with all that computation, kind of go astray. So now, but the promise is, so the reason, of course, that we don't do uh, uh, more than, I mean, even if you think, I mean, that ends up being like 2,000 to 10,000 chart reviews, right? That's a lot of time for people to be spending looking over charts. And it can take, you know, depending on what the phenotype is, it would take like one to four hours sometimes to do a chart review. So large language model, so this third, part, right, where you can kind of do an automated, if you want to think of it this way, do an automated chart review on every single patient and their condition, right, to see, you know, what does it think, right, about, you know, and it's just a kind of an extra level, right, and, uh, but, it, but it lets you actually, you know, have even more confidence in your digital twin, and then, of course, the next step is there's a lot of things. I mean, that was a big list that we had, but there could be, you know, thousands of conditions or tens of thousands of conditions, you know, that aren't even ICD-10 coded, of course. And, and that's the other thing that we can take this to. So, um, but right now I should say we are focusing on, you know, just getting the basic conditions that, you know, we want to look for, for clinical trials and so forth, get that right. And then, yeah. This is fantastic. Yes, um, can you comment on the temporal dimension of the digital twin and how robust that is versus sort of using the twin as the in the current state, sort of the aggregate uh, state of the patient? That is a great question. So the question is, yeah. So uh, regarding the the obviously, you know, diseases come out, come come become something that a patient has to contend with at some point in their life, right? And it might make a big difference as to whether, you know, they got diabetes when they were 20 versus when they were 60. And um, the way that we actually do this currently at MGB is we uh, simply go to the first time. So first we figure out what the computed phenotype is for that they do or don't have diabetes. And then if we figure out they do have diabetes, we take the first code, as good or bad as it might be, that says they have diabetes and say, okay, it's from then on, right? Which you know, it's kind of a, a, a good first pass, maybe, but it, it, it really, we could do a, a you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a yes, no, it's a graph, right, of probability, which goes from, you know, maybe they have diabetes to they definitely have diabetes, and there's some cut off in that temporal path, and um, that's something that I don't think we're really going to get a good handle on until we do these um, automated chart reviews. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 